Amen. Amen. All right, it's been 21 years since that um, terrible morning, and it is an important day for us to remember and pray for those that were specifically impacted by that. And if you have family or friends that you should reach out to, don't forget to do so uh, today about that. A few things that I want to take care of before we get started here, as you turn all your phones off, the, uh, um, the, uh, a few things just to get, uh, uh, make. first off, I want to say thank you to Pastor Jesse for last Sunday. Great job, Pastor Jesse. <clears throat> the, uh, and a few other things, just kind of the, the fall, the end of summer, fall, we have a lot of things coming uh, online. Uh, for those of you that are relatively new here, we still have been kind of functioning in um, uh, late pandemic mode as a church, and so now we're we're just going to pretend like the pandemic's not happening anymore, uh, as we just was from a, from a calendar perspective at least, and kind of get back uh, rolling in a full steam ahead. So October thirty first, a lot of people call this Halloween, but on Halloween we as a church do not curse the darkness; we bring a light to it, any kind of dark places, and so we have a light the night uh, event that night that you can be part of at different homes throughout our cities, uh, as we just bring uh, a, a love and safety to a lot of different places. Uh, another thing, on that same, right before on that weekend, October 29th and 30th, it's a Saturday, Sunday, we are having a justice weekend here. We are bringing in Bishop Walter Harvey, uh, who you will get to know and love uh, that weekend. Uh, just going to be a tremendous time for us to really uh, pay attention to our fourth uh, value here as a church, bringing justice for the oppressed. Another thing that you need to be aware of is on October 8th, uh, we are having, a, for husbands and wives and for future brides and grooms, we are having like a church date night, okay, on October 8th. It's going to be planned out. It's going to be an exciting night. Uh, somebody already said, what about the single people? <laughs> do we got to do everything? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so we'll have to figure that out. Uh, then something we've been talking about for a little bit is on Thursday evening, September 22nd at 6 p.m. is the official launch of Dinner Church over in Revere at our Revere location. So, so this will function at, like as another service, okay? But it won't be like this service. It'll be very, very different. It'll be around tables, over dinner. Uh, and for people that like this kind of bigger scenario doesn't really work for, uh, this will be a great opportunity for them to be introduced and connect with Jesus in that different environment. And so it's going to be church, but it'll be very different uh, than what you see here today. Uh, and that's at the Revere location. And the next Sunday is Back to Church Sunday. So this is kind of the line in the sand day where everybody's like, okay, it's time to stop going on vacation and pretending like I'm watching church online. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really everybody's back. And so uh, come on back, everybody. Bring somebody to church with you next week. Uh, and can I just encourage you, when you post like, hey, come to church with me on Sunday on an open Facebook invite, nobody's paying attention to that. The, uh, just go invite a human to church, like human to human, like a bring him, bring him with you kind of thing. So please, please do that. Um, a couple of years ago, we started a series uh, in the book of Exodus, where we started in Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, and we just were going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all the way through Exodus. About 6,000 sermons later, um, you know, we, we did a lot of sermons on that, but there's still two left, okay? We're going to knock one out this week and next week, and, and then we can, then you'll really have Exodus, and we'll have a whole package. You can just watch the whole thing online. You can, you can just spend days and days watching, you know, dozens and dozens of sermons if you want. The, uh, so here we go. The people of God had left their Egyptian slavery and had been out in the desert for a few months, wrestling with their new freedom. If you didn't know this, freedom isn't as easy as it sounds. You got to wrestle with your freedom. You got to stay free. They were not always successful with it, however. So God gives them a path to success, a plan. We call it the law or the Ten Commandments, the rules and regulations for how to live and act in this new and emerging nation that God is trying to create with them. Now, while their leader, whose name is Moses, is getting all the details together from God at the top of a mountain, the people, while Moses is away, the mice start to play. Okay? They immediately revert to the old ways of thinking and acting, and they begin to worship a golden calf. 
that they somehow managed to create in the brief period while Moses was gone. This is the story, Exodus chapter 32, verse 3. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these, the calf, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What? They know who brought them out of Egypt. And now they're saying it was this guy, this golden calf. These people who have been rescued from Egyptian slavery, who have seen the mighty acts of God and defeating the false demon gods of Egypt, they walk through the, same, through the sea on dry land. They watch the same sea wipe out an entire army. They've had manna from heaven and quail that God sent water from a rock and healing from snakes. And somehow, in just a moment, they are once again led astray. Apparently, by, wicked and re- by their wicked and rebellious hearts and by some people in their midst. Because not everybody in the crowd is always a true believer. Some were in the crowd for a different reason. Certainly, Satan had some disruptors amongst them, wolves in sheep's clothing, and they managed to succeed in distracting the people. Verse 5, Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings, just so you don't lose it, in front of the golden calf, in front of the false god, the graven image. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged. Somebody say indulged. They indulged in pagan revelry. It's a very descriptive phrase. Pagan revelry. So now, we, friends, we got ourselves a situation. They create an image, an idol of a false god, apparently one that they like a lot, one that they can worship, one that will let them make the rules to simply do whatever they want, however they want. Doesn't that sound similar to America today? We go around creating our own new religious systems that accommodate our own unique preferences or sins or attitudes. It is fundamentally our version of creating a golden calf, a false god to worship, because we were all born to worship. We were all created. Everybody that has been created was created to worship, so we will worship someone or something. It is who we are in our core. We are worshipers. It may be the one true living God, or it may be ourselves that we worship. It may be money that we worship. It may be the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life that we worship. But we will worship something. So when I read this passage, it's hard for me not to superimpose. This sounds like USA 2022. See, they change gods. They immediately revert to bad living, or what's called pagan revelry. And although they had been slaves for some time amongst Egypt, clearly some of them had become part of this pagan Egyptian religious system. They indulged in pagan revelry. And I believe in our modern times and in our everyday life, there is a direct correlation where people are aggressively trying to establish new religious systems or radical and unfounded reinterpretations of orthodox biblical understanding. But what these people do is they give us a tell. A tell is a clue to what a person's true intent is that someone is trying to hide. And here's the three tells that I see. The tells that I see when people are doing this is it's a quest for ungodly power, a quest for ungodly privilege, or a desire to indulge in pagan revelry. Those are the tells when people do this. So when the people gathered, they were clearly led by some group of people, and this was, in effect, a national rebellion against the rule and reign of God in their midst. 
The people had marched out of Egypt, but clearly Egypt had not yet marched out of them. And I want you to know this today. God may have set you free here today, but until you have evicted those things he set you free from out of your heart, you are still at risk. So evict those things out of your heart. Evict Egypt out of your heart. So God, when, I, when this is all, un, un, Moses comes back down and all this is discovered, God responds decisively to this abomination and he wipes out 3,000 people. And Moses then pleads with God to spare the lives of everybody else. Now jump ahead. Next chapter, chapter 33. And we find that God has not yet given up on his people. That's good news. If you read the text carefully, you can kind of tell that God might still be a little angry with them. There seems to be a little attitude in there. <laughs> but, but, but he still loves them and he's still got, got some stuff for them. So Exodus chapter 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, get going. Somebody said, get going. Get going, going, you and the people you brought up out of the land of Egypt. This is the part that I think is a little attitude-y. He doesn't say, get going, you and my people. He said, get going, you and those people (laughs) that you brought up out. So he's just, go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I told them, I will give this land to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. So get going. Tell your neighbor, get going. going. Now, I mean, you can stay in church right now, but but hold on for this, okay? (laughs) Get going. What's going on here? Get going is God saying, hey, it's time to leave this past behind. Get going. Get going, you. Get going, you and your family. So if you're here today, there is something today that you might need to leave behind. You might need to leave something behind in order to embrace the promise that God has for you. But you will not be able to embrace the promise unless you leave something else behind. Because in order to go, you have to leave. Leave this place. Well, that's exactly how another translation of the same passage says it. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. One says, get going. One says, leave this place. That's because in order to do one, you've got to do the other. Two things. You have to leave and you have to go. You need to leave behind the sin. You need to leave behind the rebellion. You need to leave behind the entrapments of this world. You need to leave behind the doubt. You need to leave behind the confusion. You need to leave behind life's disappointments. And you need to go toward the promises of God. You go towards freedom, and you go to obedience, and you go to victory, and you go to faith, and you go to confidence, and you go towards your purpose that God has for you. So what do you need to leave behind today? If I asked you, if I passed out notebooks today and pens, and I said, hey, would everybody just write down everything that you need to leave behind? You all know what you need to leave behind. I mean, most of you could fill up notebooks and notebooks with all the things you need to leave behind. All the things you need to leave, all the things you need to walk away from. Because we know, we know. We wrestle with it, we struggle with it, we know. The challenge is not usually in knowing what you need to leave behind. It's in knowing where you're supposed to go. Anybody want to know where they should go? I know where you should go. I'm going to tell you where to go right now. The first jo- service didn't get that joke. The, uh, this, is the other, this is the naughty service, right? So, so um, here's, do you know where you need to go? You need to get going to the promised land. You need to go to your promise. Get going, you. That means to the promises that God has for you. Where do you need to go? You need to go to the promise. Because his promises were true yesterday, they are true today, and they are true tomorrow. So get going, you. Get going to the promised land. Because that's exactly where you can go. To the promised land. So in the promised land, I want you to catch this. The text says, go up to the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God declares in that promise that he had made previously 
And in this moment, God declares that he is going to give them a place, a place to live, a land. And God in this moment declares that he is honoring his covenant, his promise. Honoring his promise. Even though this is, he's saying this immediately after the people abandon him. Even though the people dishonored God, here we find out that God will never dishonor himself. You may dishonor God, God will not dishonor himself. That's why it is so important for us today to recognize what the true character of God is. Because if you do not know the true character of God, you will not understand his goodness. You will not understand his grace. You will not understand that God is for you and not against you. If you think that God is opposing you, if you think that God is out to get you, if you think that God wants to crush you, if you think that God wants to send you straight to hell, you completely misunderstand the character of God. And when you hear about the promises of God, they cannot possibly apply to you if that's who you think God is. Because we all have failed. And we have all dishonored ourselves and we have dishonored God. But God's character will not permit him to dishonor himself. So when God promises something that he will do, he will do it. When God promises Satan, God made a promise to Satan that someday he would come and crush his head. It was just a matter of time. It wasn't if God was going to do it, it was when God was going to do it. So when God promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob a promised land, it wasn't if God would come through, it's when God would come through. Because when God makes a promise, he honors his promise. This is hard for us to get our head around because our thinking and God's promises are very far apart from each other. In our thinking, we say, I can't do it. But God says, you can do all things through Christ. We say, I'm too tired. God says, come to me, I'll give you rest. We say, I, I'm always worried and frustrated. God says, cast all your cares on me. We say, I can't go on, but God says, I will direct your steps. We say, I'm not able. God says, I am able. We say, I'm not worth it. God says, it will be worth it. We say, I can't manage, but God says, I will supply all your needs. We say, I'm afraid. God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear. We say, I don't have enough faith. God says, I've given everyone a measure of faith. We say, I'm not smart enough. God says, I'll give you wisdom. We say, I feel all alone. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you ever. Those are promises of God. His promises about what he will do. And that's the promise that we're talking about today. The promises that God says he will do. Certainly, God still speaks to people today. Which is why it is so critically important that you understand that when you hear God speak to you or think it's God speaking to you, that you must fully confirm that with the Word of God. Because the Word of God will tell you if it's true. For example, if you're a 28-year-old single female and you think that the Lord is promising you that He is sending you a very specific type of wealthy, tech mogul, handsome man. I'm not saying it's wrong. But you need to make sure that the Bible actually confirms that this is one of God's promises. I mean, I've been waiting for that red Dodge Viper for a couple of years now. I can't find it in the Bible anywhere, though. I'm looking. There is definitely a difference between a promise of God and the leading of God. I'm going to try to help you understand this today. The promise of God is something that he says, he declares, he will do. It is irrevocable. It is what he will do. The leading of God is something different. The leading of God is us responding to the purposes of God in the world. For example, God may be inviting you into his plans to destroy the works of Satan and set captives free. He is inviting you to do that. Those plans, though, are still dependent on the free will choice of other free will agents that may choose not to follow God's leading. 
for example, you might choose not to participate. That's not what God wants, but you might choose that not to. That is not God failing. It is most often simply someone not responding to God's leading, which is why we must make sure that we understand why we do what we do. There's this expression that my dad used to say. He would say, right is its own reward, meaning you do right because it's the right thing to do, not because of the outcome. We do right whether the outcome is what we hope for or not, because God is at work. And sometimes people don't do what God would like them to do. Maybe you notice that in life. For example, so much of the Old Testament is about that very thing, about Israelites not doing what God wants them to do. God is intentionally trying to create a nation that will be a city on a hill, a beacon of hope, a nation that will be the greatest blessing to the entire world. That's what he wants to do with Israel, and yet they frequently decide to be self-indulgent pagan instead. That seems like an unfortunate compromise. Yet, in spite of all of their failings, and in spite of all of your failings, and in spite of all my failings, God still honors every single one of his promises. Because it's not about who I am. It's about who God is. In Isaiah chapter 55, there's an interesting moment here in verse 11. God says, it's the same with my word, so the word of God. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So God's word goes out, it bears fruit, it accomplishes purposes. So that's what you see. Here's an example of this, this story. On November 20th, 1839, there were two missionaries named John Williams and James Harris, who went to the New Hebrides Islands, now called Vanuatu. Both of these missionaries were killed and eaten by cannibals on the island on that November 20th day, only a few minutes after having arrived on shore. (sighs) Imagine. One leader said, Thus were the New Hebrides baptized with the blood of martyrs, And Christ thereby told the whole Christian world that he claimed these islands now as his own. And so, a few years later, in 1848, another man tried uh, to go to this island again. His name was John Getty. He wasn't much to look at. He was just a willing and fully committed servant of God. And so, he heads to the islands. He successfully arrives. He's on shore and he is not immediately killed and eaten. That's a success. He then proceeds to learn the language of the people. He then proceeds to take this language and translate the word of God into their language. He was there for 24 years, working with these people on this one particular island. 24 years later, he left, and they put a memorial tablet on the island And it says, in memory of John Getty, born in Scotland, 1815, minister in Prince Edward Island, seven years, missionary from Nova Scotia for 24 years. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. When he left in 1872, there were no heathens. That's a significant accomplishment. But it's it's a fulfillment of the promise. It's a promise fulfilled of what God said about his word, that his word produces fruit. Word produces fruit. So a question for you to wrestle with today. What promise is God taking you to? What promise is God taking you to? And as you are coming to terms with his promise in your life, get going. Go get it. Leave behind and go to the promise. That's what you're called to do. Now, watch how God instructs them on how he's going to take care of this promise. It's a little bit twist here in the story. He says, I will send an angel. Somebody say, angel. Angel. So God's going to send an angel before you to drive out the enemies. So the Canaanites, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Go up to the land that flows with milk and honey. So an angel, this is God's plan. God's plan is that he will arrange for the current unlawful tenants of the promised land to be evicted by an angel. 
That's the plan. That's God's plan as the worship team comes up. The promised land, you see, was not possible for the Israelites to take. (laughs) They had no idea how to take the promised land because they were not a military force. But rather, Israel was just at this time a rather large group of wandering nomads with paganish tendencies. They were not a military force. And no other military force would be remotely afraid of these people under normal circumstances. God knew this. So did the Israelites. So when God says, I'm going to give you the promised land now, he makes it clear that if they do what he says and go where he says, that he will take care of executing on the promise. That he will get them the promise. Now this is a different part of the promise. The first part is what God says he will definitely do. Like he's going to give the promised land. The second part is how he's going to execute it. This part is a little bit conditional. You do the obeying, and I'll do the delivering. You follow, I will deliver. You follow, I will deliver. You obey, I will deliver. You obey, I will deliver. That works for us today, too. You do the obeying, and God will do the delivering. You see, this God delivered Daniel out of the lion's den. He delivered Joseph out of the prison. Israel out of Egypt, humanity out of endless captivity. And in our pursuit of God and His promises, we must learn to let God go before us to work it out. Instead of trying to work it all out on our own, we just do the obeying and let God do the delivering. You do the obeying, God does the delivering all the way to the promised land. Would you stand with me as we close today? Wherever you're at with this today, listen, God has a promise for you. Whether that be your promised land or a promise that's a little different than that. You need to hear this today. It's time to get going. Get going. Leave whatever behind that you need to leave and go get the promise. Go get the promise. And by the way, you're not making it happen. God is making it happen. You do the obeying. God will do the delivering. As the worship team leads, let's respond to that today. If there's something that you need to leave behind or go towards, the altars are open. Let's spend some time praying today. Let's pray this through.